Hi everybody, this is Mr. Zarzak, and in this screencast, I'm going to walk you through how to write up your PVA lab in your lab book. So let's get started. All right, by now you should have your PVA lab back. It should be graded, and a little bit of post-lab uh, conversation should have happened in your class. All right, uh, the things that I have highlighted in my little handwritten notes here are just the sections that correspond to the rubric uh, that we'll use to grade your lab book. So let's just jump right in. The introduction, what we're looking for is, it's typically going to be a paragraph of just the necessary information that a reader would need to understand the lab. Okay, so for the purpose of PVA, uh, you're going to want to go through and define position, velocity, and acceleration as those definitions are to physics. So you should be able to get those definitions from class notes or your textbook. Okay, so just very, very straightforward there. And then if you were, really want to go into depth, you could talk a little bit about what the ticker tape motor does, which is tick, tick very quickly at a uniform rate. Um, the rate is much faster than 0.1 seconds. Uh, they're, they're actually what are called AC timers that are designed to use the alternating current uh, in the electricity in the building, which is completely beyond uh, the scope of where we are at with physics right now. But So what do we need to know is it ticks fast and it ticks consistently. So we are going to assume a time interval between the dots that we circle as 0.1 seconds, okay? It's not actually 0.1 seconds, but for the purpose of our lab, it does not matter. That time value is assumed. It will not affect your significant figures or anything like that, all right? All we need to know is that the ticker tape timer ticks at a consistent rate that is not convenient for us to measure, so we will assume it to be 0.1 seconds, all right? Why are we doing this lab? Well, that's the purpose, okay? So in general... All right, we're doing this lab to derive graphical relationships between position, velocity, and acceleration. The data collection is the mechanism that gets us, gets us to be able to create the graphs and do the analysis, but the actual purpose is to get these relationships. Okay, which relationships specifically? Well, that's where we get to the hypothesis. All right. Some of the labs we do are actually what are called investigations, where we're just trying to confirm something that is already known, in which case we'd have a lab with no hypothesis. For the PVA lab, uh, we are actually have three hypotheses. All right. If you read through your lab carefully, you'll, you'll be able to see pretty quickly what those are. But, but again, we want you to get this first one right. So uh, in the lab, you're going to be looking at the slope of a DT graph. Okay. And so you're asked to make a prediction. Now, your teacher might ask you to phrase your hypothesis in an, as an if-then statement. So then the if-then statement would be, if we analyze the slope of a position time graph, we will find that that slope is equivalent to velocity. That's the way you would phrase it, okay? Uh, likewise, you're also going to analyze the slope of a velocity time graph, okay, in the hopes that it is equivalent to acceleration. So again, for that if-then statement, if the slope of a velocity time graph is calculated, uh, we will find that it is equivalent to the acceleration during that time period, all right? And then you will also look at the area underneath a VT graph, all right? If you can't read any of my handwriting, uh, good thing I'm talking so you can kind of follow along. It says area underneath the VT graph is the change in position or the displacement, all right? So again, if we analyze the area underneath a velocity time graph, we will find that that value is equivalent to the displacement during that time period, okay? So that's how you would write up your hypotheses. As far as your materials go, okay, the materials that we need for the lab are really just the ones that are relevant to the data collection, all right? So what we have here is we have the ticker tape timer, which is also called an AC motor, okay? We have the ticker tape, so that's the strip of paper that you fed through the ticker tape timer that put the dots on it. Um, and then you have the carbon disc, okay? For the purpose of this lab, something like a meter stick, I've got it there because I know that you'd use it to do your measuring, okay? But I'm listing it as much so that I can just go ahead and cross it out, okay? That would not be something that we would need for the data collection. You'll always have access to meter sticks and rulers and timers and things like that, okay? The specific things for the lab that we need are we need a ticker tape timer, okay? That's not a typical piece of lab equipment. We need the ticker tape, and we need this carbon disc. So I think I'm actually going to put this as a bullet point, too. Okay, so I was just writing this stuff up kind of stream of conscious. So three things, ticker tape, timer, ticker tape, and carbon disc. All right. As far as making a diagram, so here's where you're going to diagram the setup so that if you had to come set the lab up later, or if you showed it to somebody else, they would know the equipment that you're using. These ticker tape timers, these AC motors, are pretty common in physics. All right, so I made a picture. Um, I use Notability to help just make my diagram clean. Okay, you can certainly use a ruler. This is probably nicer than is absolutely necessary. You, you can do a lot with boxes 
and rectangles, okay? So it's not a perfect diagram, but it's good enough for me to follow. You do not need to color, okay? I just thought that I had access to the coloring, so I thought it was nice. Um, so my ticker tape timer was just a rectangle. My carbon disc is a circle that has a blue ink on it, and then my tape was kind of, of an off-white color, okay? The, the, little, the little gray mark on the top is the hammer. I don't need to label that because it's just part of the ticker timer itself, okay? So it can, like I said, it can be simple. As far as your procedure, what goes in there? All right. All we need here is we set, need a, a set of numbered steps that will take you through how you did your data collection. Okay, so you need to put the carbon disc on the ticker tape. You need to feed the tape, okay, into the ticker tape timer. You need to turn on the ticker tape timer, and then you need to pull so that you have three distinct regions, a higher velocity, a lower velocity, and a higher velocity. Okay, and then that's really it, all right? You're going to make measurements after that, and then you're going to do analysis, all right? So at most, you might put a little blurb about measuring the displacement um, from the origin, but that, that's really, that's about it. Your procedure for the lab should be fairly short and just get you through the data collection, all right? As far as the data table goes, all right, well, you submitted one with your lab, and you should have it back with some feedback, all right? Everyone is going to need to, to transpose that data table directly into their book, all right? Uh, in that data table, all right, you had to calculate the uh, change in position, so the delta D, um, the change in time, the delta T, and then the velocity. So those are all calculated values that are in that data table. So that means that next to the data table, you're going to need to have sample calculations, okay, next to it to show where those calculated values come from. All right, so you're going to want to have a sample calc, okay, one for delta D, one for delta T, and then one for the velocity, one, two, three. And you just put it right next to or below the data table, all right? As far as the graphs go, all right, uh, because we'll be doing a, a variety of hand graphing and computer graphing, we allow you to insert, the, insert graphs into the book so that if you have ones that are computer generated, you can print them out, okay, and then put them into the book directly. So why not let you do the same thing with your hand graphs? For the PVA lab, all the calculations that you do are on the graphs, which is kind of nice. So there's going to be no separate section for calculations for this lab, and that's totally okay. All right, you don't need to rewrite the calculations all over again that you've already put on the graph into the lab book. Keep them with the graph for this one, okay? Other labs, we might have those. We might have calculations separate. So, like, for example, you need to show your sample calcs next to the data table. That would comprise your calculations for this lab that are not part of the graph. All right. If you look at the rubric, you'll see that the, that the graphs do need to be corrected. Uh, that includes the calculations that go with the graphs. So, so make them nice, make them perfect. If you can correct your graded copy all right, without it turning into too big of a mess, by all means, do that. All right. If you need to make a whole new graph with new calculations to get it right because you really messed it up, fine, do that. Whatever you need. Um, when you put the graphs, and remember only two folds max if you're going to fold it up and insert it. Okay, if you're going to if you're going to like it, use adhesive like tape or something, you can tape it directly in the book. But if you are just going to attach it and fold it, it's got to be two folds max, and it's got to be set up so that your instructor can easily unfold it and look at it to check that it's been corrected. All right. As far as observation goes, all right. So that's going to be the not quantitative data, things that you saw with your senses. So for PVA lab, all right, the, the where, where you're going to make your observations, you might listen to the timer to hear that it, that it ticked consistently but very quickly. Uh, when you look at your tape, okay, without doing any measuring, you can tell that that first dot was in motion because, one, you only saw one dot, whereas the previous dot that was stationary, you should have saw, seen lots of dots as the ticker tape tap, 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 tap. Um, you could also look at that first dot and see that there is most likely going to be a, a trail or a smear, okay, that would represent that the fact that the thing was in motion. Um, so those would all be observations. You can also make observations that, hey, when the, the, when the tape was moving fast or the, the dots were face, spaced farther apart or when the tape was going more slowly, the dots were bunched up. All right, so I think I just listed off at, at least five observations there. You need a minimum of three, so hopefully that should be pretty easy for you. When you get into the interpretation section, this is where you're going to take and you're going to explain what the numbers that you calculate tell you, okay? And this is a big one. This gets dropped a lot. You need to quote the numbers, okay? We're not just speaking in general terms here. Here's where, look, I did the lab. I've got my data. I did my calculations. This is what those numbers mean, all right? So just as a couple of, of, of examples here, okay, so I've just made up some hypothetical numbers. Um, 
this is where you can use the lab questions to your advantage, all right? You're not allowed to transpose the questions specifically. Those questions are there to help you write up your narrative, all right? So one of the questions in the lab asks you to compare the process of calculating slope to the process of calculating velocity. Now, you're not allowed to be like, question two, you know, calculate, compare this process, but, but when you get in your interpretation, you can talk about, okay, what you did. Hey, in the lab, we computed the velocity for a given change in time. We then took and we calculated the slope of the position time grab. We observed that the formula that we used was exactly the same. We observed that the data values that we used, including the units, were exactly the same. Because of all of this, it is reasonable that the slope of a velocity graph is, in, or the slope of a position graph is velocity. Okay, so you're kind of summarizing the logic and you're quoting the direct number. So I have some, some hypothetical numbers here that will, of course, be different than yours. Okay, but I would use that in my narrative. The slope was 1.2 meters per second. The velocity during that time frame was 1.2 meters per second. Same value, same unit, same way of calculating. These two things, the slope and the velocity, are equivalent. You can apply that same process for the for the slope of the VT graph. And I misspelled slope. Look at that. Here, let's put that over there. How did that get like that? Okay, well, that's a slope, I promise. Um, same process for the slope of the VT graph, okay, and then the same process for the area underneath the velocity time graph and the corresponding change in position on the position time graph, okay? So you want to address all three there. So the interpretation is going to be probably a healthy paragraph for you to hit all that stuff, all right? In terms of the error analysis, okay, so for the, the goal is to get in the range of like three to five errors. I myself will take three errors as long as they are legitimate errors and you explain the bullet points that come with them below. For this first round through, you might want to think about doing a couple more just to give yourself a little cushion, all right? As far as the errors go, uh, what we're looking for is for the source of the error. So, so, so some of the errors are, that are inherent to the lab that we can't do much about, and other ones are uh, limits to the precision of our tools, things like that, all right? So in terms of the PVA lab, easy errors can have to do with the way that you had to, to measure the displacements, okay? Many, many of you struggled early on with like, well, how do I measure to these dots, and this is all smudged, or this is too light, okay? Any of those things are potential error sources. And likewise, um, the time values are assumed as well. So there's another potential source of error. Uh, when you read your position values to compare to the area underneath the graph, okay, you're having to make a measurement directly on the graph itself. So like when you read a point on the graph that's not from the data set, you are in fact making a, measure, or making a measurement, which is inherent to error. Um, in addition to identifying the source, okay, you need to address what part of the data this affected. All right, so, the, so the, the fact that the ticker tape motor was the, ticked at a rate that we, could not, uh, that we could not measure exactly has an effect on our time data when we're making measurements of the displacement. Okay, it limits the precision of the meter stick or smudges with the dots or lightly colored dots. They all have an effect on the displacement, which is then used to calculate velocity which is then used to calculate acceleration, okay? So what is the effect? Like, track it through uh, in terms of the way that the data was used to identify the effect. All right, and then last but not least, um, how would you make it better next time? Offer up potential for a solution. Determine the actual time value of the ticker tape motor. Um, get a new meter stick. Find, find a tool that has a higher degree of precision, although down to the tenth of a millimeter is pretty, is pretty good. Okay, um, get a better light source and get a microscope so that you can really identify the, the very beginning of the dots. There's lots of things that you can do. All right, uh, take your graph and, and plot it on software so that you can get more precision in plotting your points. Any, any of those things, okay, can be potential ways to improve the analysis, to improve the data collection, or ultimately get you better answers for your conclusion. All right, and then finally, when we reach the conclusion, Okay, our conclusion is very short. Your conclusion should address the hypothesis. So you're responding, okay, to your hypothesis. Were they correct or were they not? Your three hypotheses dealt with slopes and areas from the two graphs, okay? So when you write your conclusion, you're going to want to address that. The slope of the position time graph was the velocity. The slope of the velocity time graph was the acceleration or is the acceleration. The area underneath the velocity time graph is the displacement during that time period. 
Okay, so your, your conclusion should be short. So if someone's reading your lab, they want to look at your hypothesis and say, what were you trying to find or what were you trying to prove? And then jump to your conclusion and say, did it work or did it not? All right. Uh, just a heads up too, if your lab has no hypothesis, then there's nothing to conclude, in which case your interpretation takes care of all of your analysis. You actually stop the lab report after the error analysis. Okay, so... I know that was quick, or maybe this video is very long, I'm not even sure, but hopefully all that information will be useful to you as you're transposing um, and synthesizing all this stuff from the PVA and your lab book. If you have questions, there's lots of good resources out there. Um, just a few things that we've got posted on the channel. We have sig fig tutorials, so both with how to, to make the measurements and how to do calculations uh, with significant figures. We've got a great video on all of our graphing procedures that's like 25 minutes long. So, I mean, there's plenty of things that um, you can look at there. <coughs> Excuse me. And then a reminder, because it gets missed, um, if you have calculated values in your data tables, uh, please do make sure to show sample calculations. All right. Beyond that, there's all kinds of stuff that's posted online for you for additional resources so that you don't have to watch the entire video. And, of course, your instructors really want to help you get this right as well. So don't be afraid to reach out to us. All right. So this is Mr. Zizek saying thank you for watching. All right. Good luck with this first write-up. And I will see you around Glenbard West. Bye-bye.